into the winner's circle. Be prepared for transformation. Welcome to Empowered to Win with Apostle T.B. Walker, founder of Disciples of Faith Fellowship of Churches and senior pastor of Disciples of Faith, Wilmington, Delaware. Hi, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to welcome you once again to Empower to Win, where we are learning together. Certainly thank you once again for tuning in. Title of this particular teaching session is called Welcome to the Fun House. I want to read a scripture to you. It's, called, it's from Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Instead, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So, you know, as we look at the news and we look around our churches and, you know, what we can actually see with our own eyes. And we've heard it from, you know, time and time again that the church is actually losing its young people. And if this trend continues, uh, the church as we know it is actually going to be dead. It won't we it won't be here. And even devoted Christian families, uh, you know, parents are losing their children to the world. Uh, you know, as soon as they are in their teen years, for some reason, it seems like uh, the children are falling away. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Now, to start with, what we have to recognize is that it is an absolute fact that the church is losing its young people. Uh, some statistics, if you just look at some of the polls, they actually show that three quarters, three fourths of teenagers intend to leave church once they leave their parents' houses. And the true number is that 88% of children uh, who are raised up in Christian homes left the church at the age of 18. Now, here's a counter thought, and I want to give this to you. You know, as we make this case for, like, what is the church doing? How, why are we losing our young people? Uh, there's a, a case to be made that these children are not actually leaving, but instead, God never had them in the first place. Let, let's rephrase the question. Why aren't the hearts of these children who've been raised, these, these young people who've grown up in the church, who've been around kingdom culture, who've actually seen even miracles and seen the true workings of God, and they've seen so much and even experienced so much of the grace of God, why aren't they being led by him? Now, I'll tell you what's been happening in the church. There is a funhouse solution that many people have come up, come up with. You know, Christians have seen this uh, over time. They've seen this problem for a long time. So the solution has been to create youth groups with some snazzy names, maybe uh, pizza parties or, you know, movie night or amusement park trips that, that we will take to keep, you know, keep the kids entertained. So instead of filling them with the love of God, which is actually the problem, the problem was never that, wow, they're leaving the church. The real question was, did they ever have it in the first place? And so as you begin to look at this, when the problem came, for us, the solution was not the word of God. For us, the solution was entertainment and fun. So instead of filling them with the love of God, we filled them with entertainment. And we actually teach them that the church is the place to actually get that entertainment. So... The leaders and the adults who are charged with raising these children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord are operating in ignorance and short-sightedness and don't realize that by adding this kind of fun and entertainment, as opposed to what the church is actually charged to give, we actually add fuel to the fire. And when you look at this, because the root of so many of these situations is that their hearts are actually not given to Jesus, that they're actually going through the motions all these years, that many of the children actually are not in the word, don't uh, understand the word, have never given their hearts over to Jesus, that by adding fun to the mix, we're not bringing them closer to Christ. We're actually driving them further and further away from him. Now, there is a culture of kingdom. And we've got to ask ourselves, what are we going to choose, the culture of the world or the culture of the kingdom? Now, I want you to understand our culture that we live in, especially even American culture, emphasizes fun for youth. That's what we do. It says that the purpose of youth, the purpose of being young is simply to have fun and to be served. So when little Tommy decides at 15 or 16 that he wants to get a job, that he wants to make his own money, wants to start taking care of his own needs, we actually restrict him. And so instead of valuing this work ethic, instead of applauding the fact that Tommy now is moving into another stage in his life where he wants to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, that he wants to have some 
some accountability for what he's doing. No, no. We tell little Tommy, no, no, no. This is the time in your life you're supposed to have fun. You, you know, you'll have your whole life to work. So have some fun right now. And don't be shocked that that's exactly what little Tommy's going to do. So when it's time to kind of deal with serious things, we shouldn't be shocked that Tommy moves those serious things out a couple years because that's what we teach him. It's a couple years away. It's a couple years away. He lives to have fun simply because that's what he's been told to do. You'll notice that in this place, in, in our solution, we don't look at Bible study. We don't look at prayer. We don't look at serving others as Christ has actually served us. We don't put those things on the list as we look at Dorney Park and as we look at some of our great amusement parks, as we look at some of these fun things that we're thinking about as a solution, we've taken out service. So it's simple. And I'll tell you why we don't, we don't really offer those things, because they aren't fun. They don't look fun. So, and we look and say, well, they're not going to want to do that. So I'm going to tell you why Paul instructed Timothy in 2 Timothy verses 4, uh, 2 through 3. Here's what he said. Preach the word. Be instant or be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Here's a newsflash. That time has come. If your, if your church is not teaching the truth straight from the Bible, then how can people recognize error? How are these young people going to actually recognize error? And on top of that, how can they grow? Do you understand that an unsaved membership, people who are in the church, unsaved, absolutely void of any knowledge of the Holy Spirit, they have no capacity whatsoever to overcome self-will. They have no capacity to overcome their own personal agendas. They cannot fight sin and they cannot fight the love of sin. Only believers with the divine power of the Holy Spirit actually can shake these things off, can take those things off, that the Spirit of God actually takes off that old man and they can manifest the Spirit of God. There is an absolutely diabolical trap in believing that part of the church's divinely ordained, appointed mission is to provide entertainment and fun for people, even with the hope of winning them. So, you know, when we look at this, providing amusement for people is nowhere actually spoken of in the scripture. It's not a mandate that Christ has actually given the church. You know, he says, listen, let me tell you the condition of the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church that the gates of hell should not prevail against it. That there's things that are trying to prevail against the church. And it is not the role of the church to be a fun house, to be a fun center. So the trend of making the mandate of the church, you know, using entertainment as one of the basic tools for kingdom worship and enticement to actually draw people to the church is actually anti-Christian. It is not the mandate that God has given. Is it wrong to, uh, to find the church entertaining? Absolutely not. No, there's, there's nothing wrong there at all. Are we supposed to have long faces and is, is the church supposed to be a sullen place? Absolutely not. The Bible tells us, the Lord said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. There are multiple instruments that are used. There's dancing and singing, but it's worship. And the reality is we worship God because of who he is and, and because he is worthy of the worship and he commands it not for entertainment value. When a church is determined to make entertainment, pleasure, emotional, sensory comforts, the actual draw of the focal point of a service, the focal point of worship, then we have a problem. Let me read something to you from Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 13. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What am I saying? It is the foremost mission of the church to stand for the truth of God's word and to build up, to teach, to inform, to edify and to comfort the saints and to reach out to the lost. It's our task to make sure that the world is aware of the opportunity that the gospel actually brings for all men to know God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is his son. And guess what? God has also placed on us the onus, the responsibility of making people aware and to making it clearly known of the final and eternal judgment that awaits all who reject him or that awaits all who receive him balance and truth. So we now operate in a given what they want type of uh, background. Listen, there's a math problem. 
And, and I understand it. Listen, some people do the shrinking uh, attendance in the church and e expanding uh, expenses. So, so we've got less people, but we've, the expenses are still growing. They've adopted a notion of giving people what they want. That's actually part of the church growth plan. So we look at old things. You know, Bible study is kind of an old thing. Discipleship looks like it's all outdated. It's old fashioned. It's negative. Righteousness, victory over evil, uh, you know, conquering sin. All of those things have become old fashioned. Those are things that, you know, the people aren't going to want. Let me give you, let me tell you about this. And I, and I don't, I'm not going to use any names here, but there, there's a, there's a mega church out, uh, out in the Western part of the United States, out, out in California. There's multiple branches, uh, all over the United States. Uh, and as this mega pastor was going out, uh, looking to, to plant a church in a particular community, one of the things that he did was he conducted a poll. Uh, he went out into an area, he found an area, and he, and he recognized this is a fertile area because he saw that just by what he saw with his eyes and what he could actually tell by some conversations with people, that this was a uh, an unbeliever, uh, the unsaved, fertile territory for, for drawing the lost, for, for receiving the lost, for the lost, actually receiving the word and the salvation through Jesus Christ. So when he did this, he went out, he took a poll and he asked the residents of the surrounding area what kind of church they wanted. What kind of things that they were interested in? What kind of things did they not like? And so with those results in his hand, he goes out and he proceeds to model his church after those suggestions and some of the information that he received from the community. Now, you may not get it yet, but I want you to get it here because I'm going to say it to you plain. He received his information and modeled his church from information that he received from a largely unsaved population. So he took un information from people who have ideas and knowledge that is diametrically opposed to the very ideas of the kingdom and modeled his church based on those ideas that come from the world and not come coming directly from Jesus Christ. Jesus needs no help in modeling the church. He said, I created the church and I'm going to make sure that the gates of hell, that's even culture. He says, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't prevail against the church. Can you imagine the apostles going out and putting their finger in the wind and asking people, you know, what's your opinion? You know, what, what, tell me which way the world is blowing so we can model our church after the world. You know, give them what they want ha is not now and has never been an authentic God-ordained strategy for growth. In fact, if you look at it, it's a mirror opposite of the plan which the Bible demands. Listen, the, the world, we're supposed to turn the world upside down. But understand this, there is going to bring some division. This is not about giving the world what they want. The Bible says, Jesus said, listen, do you think I came to bring peace into the world? He says, no, I came to bring division. The gospel is going to offend some people. And guess what? Everybody's not going to want it. And we're not here to inject our ideas uh, into God's actual plan. You know, what it actually does, is by injecting our thoughts and injecting our ideas and injecting morals that are contrary to the word of God and, e and even concepts that don't fit into the kingdom, then what we do is that we actually operate in worldly compromise. And we do all this to what? To attain the goal of church growth with a God who adds to the church as he actually sees fit. It's actually deceptive. And it's a dangerous strategy for leaders to involve, to actually engage in. Listen, in modern times, we are watching churches actually look and, and ask themselves not how far or how close they can get to the plan that God has given, but literally how close they can get to the world. How close can we walk in, in, in with a plan, a corporate plan that, that's been given to us by the world that looks so successful as opposed to how close can we get to God's truth? We want to live in his truth. M many Churches are actually counting on the entertainment factor to carry them for one reason, because they are void of spiritual depth and power. They have no power. We've got to get back to the truth. L listen, here's the truth. Fun is actually all about me. It's actually about me enjoying myself. Am I saying that, that we should have no fun? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. It, it, am I saying there's anything inherently wrong about having fun? No. Not, not in all instances, but it's a self-focus when it becomes the point of your life. We're teaching a generation that the point of their life is fun, that their point of their life is self-gratification. We're not teaching them that there is a, a point of their life is to think about somebody else other than them.
And when we nurture horrible behavior, it shouldn't, we shouldn't be shocked when we get a horrible harvest because we've sown horrible seeds. You know, we are looking for heaven on earth. And the scripture clearly tells us that's not what God's plan for us. That we have taught ourselves and we're walking in now self-focus. And that self-focus moves us into a an actual downward spiral where people are looking for fun things. And so when they look for fun things, they go to entertainment. And what does entertainment teach? It teaches you to be yourself. Don't let anyone control you. Live sexually unrestrained. You know, do what makes you feel good. And listen, you know, when you look at those things, when you, when you hear that, that's a message that sounds so liberating, when in reality, it's a totally different message in the kingdom. It is not be who you are. It is be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that, that you need to have the mind of Christ. It is not don't let anything control you. It is being under the control of the Holy Spirit, who is the person of God. It is not living sexually restrained, but it is having, as the ninth fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And it's not doing what makes you feel good. It's doing what you were designed to do and what actually pleases God. So when, you, when, you, when we've been told, you know, as we told them, go have fun, then we shouldn't be shocked that they seek fun and not God. And when they decide to seek fun instead of God, they're bombarded with messages that are absolutely contrary to the things that they're hearing on the pews on Sunday. So I want you to contrast this with what you see in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Cross Entertainment isn't always wrong, but it, it's, when you make your life about it, that's what's wrong. You know, while we're telling our young people to look for fun, guess what happens? They don't look for God because he's not in the fun category. You know, we've kind of told them when, when it's time to look for serious things, they're not going to think about God because we've been taught. They, we've actually taught them that, you know, listen, God, the church is not for serious thinkers. You know, it, this is, it, the, it's about fun. So as we keep them in these youth ministries that are all about fun, we're not teaching them the this, this serious word. When it comes down to serious things, they will not see the church as serious, nor will they see church remedy, the church as a remedy. But the remedy is actually very simple. We've got to push our church. We've got to push our children. We've got to push all seekers to seek God instead of living for fun. You know, one of the things we've got to do is that we've got to start confronting head on the difficult questions of biblical doctrine and truth. We've got to face it. The Bible says study to show yourself approved, not unto people, not that you're fun, but to prove unto God that you are a workman who needs not be ashamed because you're able to rightly divide the word of truth. Listen, we've got to stop pretending that following God makes all your problems disappear. We've got to stop telling our kids that church is about fun and that if they just follow the Lord, that everything is going to be fine. Well, guess what? Everything eternally is going to be wonderful, but these are people who are geared to be problem solvers, not problem avoiders. And we're trying to teach our kids to avoid the confrontation with destiny by giving them toys instead of giving them the word of God. Listen, I want you to understand this. I don't need to be entertained and the children don't need to be entertained, but they do need to know Jesus. So we've got to change this because this is not the fun house. This is the house of prayer. So. Just remember this, no matter what's going on in your world, no matter what's happening around you, just remember this, you are empowered to win. Stop.